Teresa Samuel, uh, and she will present on, uh, on the impact of programmable payments on the industry. Enjoy. Yeah, thank you so much for intru uh, introducing me. Um, maybe I give a short introduction on me. My name is uh, Teresa Samuel. I originally have a background in uh, management and economics, um, then worked for the European Central Bank for two and a half years in uh, different directorates before um, coming to Cash on Ledger um, as uh, in a role as a product owner. Um, so I'm mainly busy with uh, developing our product further um, and defining our market offering. Um, yeah, so many thanks again for giving us from Cash on Ledger the chance to speak today. Um, yeah, and as was uh, as uh, it was mentioned, my presentation uh, will be on the impact of programmable payments on the industry. Um, when speaking about programmable payments, uh, what comes to mind right away is the digital euro. Therefore, it for sure is worth it to take a little excursion into the history and fundamentals of money. Um, so, a good starting point of uh, what defines a good starting point is um, the question of what defines money as such. Um, there are three main functions of money. Money primarily serves as a means of exchange or payment. Um, a second, money is used as a unit of account. And lastly, money must function as a storage of value. So we want to be able to price and exchange goods and store value with money. Okay, so these are the criteria money should fulfill, uh, fulfill in order to be considered as money. And these criteria are something we should always keep in mind when talking about it. Um, when we want to understand where we are going, apart from the functions of money, it is important to understand uh, where we are coming from and which are the different forms of money that exist today. So at this point, a little look into history makes sense. Um, the different forms of money we know today are cash, of course, commercial bank money and central bank money of which commercial bank money for end consumers, so for you and me, um, is the most prominent form. Uh, but how, how did we get there? Um, before 1661, money was used in form of metal coins. Uh, and actually, only due to a scarcity in silver in Sweden, uh, the Stockholm's bank for the first time printed paper money. Um, and the value of this paper money was guaranteed by a deposit in a bank. Then in the 19th century, a system of national central banks emerged in Europe. Uh, in Germany, for example, the Reichsbank emerged from the Prussian bank um, and had the exclusive right to issue banknotes from 1909, uh, while the Fed in the US was actually only founded in 1913. Uh, so we see paper money and our monetary system as we know it today really isn't that old. Um, moving on in time, a next significant trend uh, can be observed in the 1960s when first ATMs were installed. Um, they spread quite fast and became very popular and really changed the way people accessed and used money. Uh, and then came the Internet. Um, in the 1990s, we are talking of the so-called Internet of Information, um, a huge milestone being the first website programmed by Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, what we witnessed uh, significant changes in banking when the internet really became popular and gained in traction and importance. Um, but how so? Um, in the world of money and banking, the meat chip was introduced in 1996 by Sparta Bank and in essentially um, really enabled online banking. So what we saw back then for the first time was a significant shift from cash money to um, a virtual uh, commercial bank money. Um, we could say a shift from haptic to somehow digital money. So really how people interact with money. And this new thing, online banking, opened many doors. Uh, from then on, so really starting with uh, basic online banking, a whole new industry has evolved. Um, from online banking, we emerged to mobile banking and eventually came to direct banking. Customers really no longer want to go into a physical bank branch. They want their banking to be fast and accessible. Um, and they use innovative direct banks like N26. And uh, I believe most of us are familiar with the immense success story of N26 nowadays being uh, one of the world's highest valued and most well-funded fintechs. So we see payments and our monetary system have really always been evolving and, and still are. But maybe let's take a step back into the 90s. 
Another interesting development we have witnessed during those times was the rise of Amazon. And especially interesting in our context is the positive correlation we can observe between the success story of Amazon and the establishment of online banking. And it really makes sense. A business model as the one of Amazon, or generally speaking of online retail really, is made possible by the advancement of payment system, specifically being online banking. So I can now order my new pairs of shoes online because I can also um, pay for them online. And that is quite interesting to have in mind when looking where we are standing today. We actually find ourselves in a similar, similar situation um, when we look at the world of IoT, so the Internet of Things. Um, it is estimated that in 2025, around 46 billion IoT devices will generate almost 80 zettabytes of data. What is missing to actually seize this huge opportunity um, and build business cases from it are appropriate payment options. What the industry needs to make use of um, uh, of all the data they are really already collecting today are frictionless and autonomous end-to-end -end financial solutions. Basically, what we have to do is um, we have to bridge the same gap as we had to in the 1990s for the emerge of online retail. So what we saw back then was essentially the same dynamic we see today, uh, bridging the gap between the industry and banking, broadly speaking. And this is where we come back to the evolution of the internet after the 1990s. Um, in 2009, we then, after the Internet of Information in the 90s, moved into the Internet of Value with the new value transfer system, the blockchain, and the first cryptocurrency, the Bitcoin. And I think uh, in this uh, forum, I don't have to go uh, deeper into, into the history. But in the context of money, how should we actually classify the Bitcoin? Um, due to its very high volatility, the Bitcoin really doesn't qualify as a currency as such. Um, and therefore also doesn't pose a risk for central banks. Um, if we remember the functions of money I talked about at the beginning of my presentation, one of those was the storage of value. A currency like the euro is relatively stable, also in regards to inflation when it comes to, to its value. And that clearly is not given here. I, can, I cannot buy a Bitcoin today expecting it's worth to be the same tomorrow. So we can say that a cryptocurrency like the Bitcoin are not a currency, but instead are a new asset class. And they can be an alternative for gold, for example, but not for money. And in the context of programmable payments and uh, potential solution, this brings us to DM or Libra, how it was called originally in the beginning. Um, this private initiative could uh, solve the described problem as it uh, does potentially function as a currency. But exactly because of this, that actually poses a huge risk for central banks. And this risk has led to the point that due to the MICA regulation, DiEM uh, will not be able to launch in Europe in the near future. Um, and DiEM has oriented itself back towards the US, where they already got positive signals and will very likely launch a pilot in the near future. And that, of course, is going to be very interesting, interesting to follow. But so with DM not launching in the European market anytime soon, uh, we are left with a problem I, I briefly outlined before, uh, with a need for integrated financial services. Um, we do have a connected industry, but it is not connected to financial services. And therefore, there is no possibility for a seamless integrated payment system. So what is missing is a technical platform and an uh, infrastructure to connect the industry of today with the financial services uh, to enable new, truly digital business models to be implemented. Um, and uh, the kind of automation we are technically able to provide today um, really depends on the digital euro and the possibility of new digital asset classes. Um, and to end automation and frictionless payment integration will not work without the digital euro. Um, but as a little side note, maybe just having a digital currency only solves half the issue, really, as you will see in a minute when I uh, will further introduce you to our first use case. Um, what the industry also needs in order to, um, to implement new business models is the provision of the according financing layers. Okay, so what, op uh, what options for, for a digital form of the euro are out there? What we see today being developed in this direction are three different alternatives. 
Um, we have the public initiative with CBDC, so central bank digital currencies, um, taken up by the central banks and the European case being the ECB uh, at the moment discussing to, to launch a respective project. And then we have uh, two private options being programmable uh, commercial bank money and crypto stable coins. The first being mainly pursued by commercial banks and the latter by fintechs. And all of these alternatives may become interesting for the interest for the industry. Um, which one of them will prevail though um, is to be seen in the future. Because also from a business perspective, it really doesn't matter too much as long as the solution in the end really is fit for purpose. But, my, uh, but now let me uh, let me maybe move on to, to a concrete example of where we actually need programmable payments in the real world. Uh, the answer is pay-per-use models, which create flexibility for SMEs. With Cash on Ledger, what we do, um, we have a first real use case that is live since April together with Lindner Traktorenwerke from, uh, from Austria. Um, and maybe I'll give you a quick idea of what, what we are doing here. So Lindner really extended their business model by offering its clients a pay-per-use rental model for their tractors. And this includes um, a dynamic database pricing uh, slash business model. Um, that is to say, we can differentiate or we can differently price um, the, uses, the usage of a tractor. If I uh, use the tractor to drive from village A to B, I pay a certain price. And if I actually use it on the field or in the forest to work, um, I can I can put a higher price to that. We furthermore have um, innovative and cost efficient additional services, um, such insurance included in in this model. Um, so what we as Cash on Ledger did for Lindner um, basically is digitizing and automating the rental process completely. We implemented uh, an automated usage based billing, invoicing, and uh, an accounting platform. And also um, created a transparency over the asset life cycle and usage to, to calculate or to be able to really calculate a correct residual value. Um, together um, with our partner, with our banking development partner, LBBW, so uh, Germany's biggest state-owned bank, we also take care of payment orchestration um, that can also include multi-parties, like in this case with uh, an insurance being involved. Then we uh, are partnered with Infineon um, and they support us with, uh, with hardware-based security solutions. And last but not least with uh, ANV, which is uh, one of Germany's biggest insurance company to be able to provide digital insurance products. But maybe um, it is interesting to speak a bit more general and abstract uh, this specific use case. So, Digitization and um, IoT enables these new forms of data-driven business models, which in turn facilitate growth without over-leveraging the business. Um, but why is that and what does it really look like? So what we see among clients um, is a shift in preference from CAPEX to OPEX, meaning end, end uh, customers of machines. So in our example, the pharma, for example, um, prefer to um, to increase their operational expenditures uh, and keep their capital expenditures low, which keeps their balance light and gives uh, gives them freedom to to keep their cash flows liquid. Um, and this trend really has been accelerated by the by the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we have the OEM, so the original equipment manufacturer. Now our use case this this would be Lindner. Um, and of course, he's happy to provide a new business model and even extend the distribution channels by such, but he faces two big problems. First, he's limited by his own balance sheet. And second, um, the increased complexity and costs of his back office. So we need to find a solution to, um, to automate processes uh, on the one side and to cover the OEM's new financing needs. Um, meaning Lindner now can offer a pay-per-use model to its clients because as of now, we are talking about roughly 30 machines being rented out. But if we talk about hundreds of machines, Lindner faces the issue of not being able to, um, to have all of these machines on its own balance sheet. And that really is where, where the investors come into the picture. So we have the investors on the other end that in these days of negative interest rates are really actually looking actively for, for new asset classes. 
Um, and what is missing for them as of now is like a complete life cycle transparency of assets that you theoretically could invest in. An investor really wants to know what he invests in and what is the state of the asset, et cetera. So here we see a bit um, of what I teased on before. We need programmable payments for um, for one side of the solution, but we, we also really need new ways of financing on the other side. So yeah, this is a real life use case from the agricultural industry, um, but similar models, very similar models can be thought and actually are being thought um, in, in many more industries like medicine, technology, man machine manufacturing in general, renewable energy, et cetera. Um, so we see a clear trend of businesses moving into this direction. Um, so maybe a few words on what exactly we are doing at, uh, at Cash on Ledger. Um, what we do is we bridge the world between the industry and financial institutions. Um, and how do we do that? We do that by automating payments, um, by building the payment infrastructure for data-driven business models, um, by deriving transparency over the asset lifecycle and track the generated cash flow for each asset, and by creating new financial asset classes based on the cash flow performance um, of, of those real assets. Our product is basically shaped in a uh, shape of two main components, exactly reflect the, uh, reflecting the, the mentioned components. Um, the first com uh, component being the operator platform um, and the other one being our financial platform. Um, yeah, but maybe to briefly wrap it up. Uh, what we have seen is uh, how our monetary system has evolved over the years and that there's a strong link between the evolution of the economy and financial services. Um, we are now at a point uh, where the industry needs programmable payments to implement new business models that have been given rise through the digital transformation and um, by IoT. Um, and business processes are fundament fundamentally changing. Um, and really depend on financial services to go along with these changes in order for companies to maintain competitiveness. So um, I think I leave it here. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, the opportunity to present at this great event. Um, if you have further questions or are interested to discuss certain aspects in more depth, um, here are my colleagues and uh, my contact details. So please feel free to reach out uh, at any time. Thank you very much, Teresa, for this vivid presentation. I especially liked how you explained the disconnected state of integrated financial services. There are indeed questions uh, from the audience, and I'm very glad that you take them. Um, did you implement blockchain technology directly into your, into your solutions, or do you use um, an alternate um, comparable technology? Uh, so, yeah, that is a very good question. Um, our solution is not uh, based on the blockchain itself. Uh, we really believe in, in using technology where it is fit for purpose, so where it really brings a benefit to the, to the business uh, case, and that clearly depends on the use case. Um, in case of Lindner, for example, we are using the blockchain mainly um, for an authorizing function. Um, we, ha we, we do have different parties being involved in the business case, um, one being the, the insurer, so when a farmer is out on the field, and the machine breaks, uh, someone has to pay for that, which is why an integrated insurance really makes sense. Um, but of course, when orchestrating multi-party business um, based on data, it is absolutely crucial that um, every involved party really trusts the data and can check if the data has been tampered with. So here for us, it clearly makes sense to integrate the blockchain. Um, where DLT in general becomes interesting for our product, of course, is payment solutions. Um, so yeah, here blockchain plays a role as well. And we do have other use cases, and I think, unfortunately, I, I can't uh, tell much more detail about those yet. But um, and those blockchain really takes a more prominent role, but that really is due to the nature of the business case, and not because we are trying to push the blockchain into into every business. Well, thank you very much. Well, you got me interested at least. Um, there would be another question, and I'd ask you to um, answer briefly this one. Um, could you uh, again for our audience? Uh, very briefly explain the difference between uh, programmable payments and programmable money? Um, yeah, so programmable money is um, basically defined as a form of digital money that can be programmed itself by users. So the program would really be inside of the coin. 
um, which would be a great step, but also a big step and would need considerable amount of technical uh, technical um, innovation. Uh, programmable payments on the other side um, describes a transaction where the conditions are determined in advance. Like if event X happens, then the transaction is triggered. Um, and at the moment, I think programmable payments are really sufficient for most of our use cases. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you very much, Teresa.